In valuation, one of the most often used terms is the term sustainable growth. In this data set, I look at the sustainable growth rates by industry group. But before you use it, I'd like to add a few cautionary notes and understanding of the numbers as you see them. Let's step back. To think about sustainable growth, let's start with an algebraic truth, which is operating income is equal to return in invested capital times invested capital. So this is not a formula. It's just, it's just a breakdown of operating income. If your return on capital is stable, the only way for you to grow your operating income is to increase your invested capital. Let me repeat that again. If your return on invested capital stays stable, the only way for your operating income to go up is to increase your invested capital. How do you increase your invested capital? By putting more into capex than you depreciate by investing in working capital. In other words, the change in invested capital is the reinvestment you see in a free cash flow to the firm calculation can net capex, change in working capital, even acquisitions. So the change in invested capital is the reinvestment you see in a free cash flow firm. And the effect on operating income will depend on what kind of return on invested capital you earn in that reinvestment. So again, remain, remember, we're still remaining in a world where return on capital is stable. The growth in operating income can be written as the return on invested capital multiplied by what's called the reinvestment rate, which is reinvestment divided by after-tax operating income. So let me put some numbers in. Let's suppose your return invested capital is 20%. You reinvest 400 million out of a billion dollars in after-tax operating income. Your reinvestment rate is 40%. 20% times 40% gives you an expected growth of 8%. That is what I'm trying to report in this data set, but it works only if you have companies with stable returns in invested capital. Now, in case you're wondering what goes into return invested capital, there's an entire data set on return invested capital where I talk about this more broadly. But return on invested capital is operating income after taxes. We take the operating income, earnings before interest and taxes, act like you pay taxes on that operating income. Even though you don't, you pay it on taxable income, you act like you pay taxes. You can use the effective tax rate or the marginal tax rate. I prefer the effective tax rate to capture after tax operating income and I divide by invested capital. What does that include? Book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash and marketable securities. Why do I net out cash and marketable securities? Because operating income is on operating assets and cash and marketable securities are not operating assets. So that's how you compute a return invested capital. So when you look at this data set and you look at the return invested capital numbers, here are some of the choices I made that drive those numbers. For my operating income, I start with the most the earnings before interest and tax for the most recent 12 months, but adjust for two things. One is leases. In case accountants have not capitalized leases, which increasingly IFRS and GAAP requires them to do, I capitalize for them. Take lease expenses out of operating income, but create lease asset that I depreciate. And I also capitalize R&D because I'm looking at 47,000 companies and can't apply a lot of finesse. I use a five-year life for all companies and I capitalize R&D. So those adjustments show up in my operating income. So my after-tax operating income for the most recent 12 months with leases and R&D adjusted for. Invested capital, I start with the book value of equity and the book value of debt at the start of the year, most recent fiscal year from the accounting balance sheet. But here again, if leases are not treated as debt, I bring them on to the debt and if R&D is not capitalized, which it isn't for most firms, I capitalize R&D and bring it into book equity. I do net out the cash and marketable securities from the start of the most recent fiscal year. So my return on invested capital is a one year number from the most recent 12 months. Take it or leave it. That's, that's you know, that it, it comes with limitations because one year numbers can jump around. That's how I get the return on invested capital. To get the reinvestment rate, I need net capex, so I start with capex and depreciation from the statement of cash flows. I capitalize R&D, as I mentioned earlier, it is really cap. I do include change in working capital and cash acquisition. So basically, my measure of reinvestment is as broad as I can make it given the data I have. So it's net capex, traditional net capex, change in working capital, but it also includes cash acquisitions and the capitalization effect of R&D. That reinvestment number obviously can be volatile. It can swing from big, you know, positive numbers to big negative numbers. You can end up with a negative reinvestment in any given year. But I, since I aggregate across companies, hopefully some of that is cleansed by the, by the aggregation. But my reinvestment rate is the aggregate reinvestment across all companies in a group divided by the aggregate 
after-tax operating income of all companies in that group. So when you look at this data set, what you're getting is a return on investment capital and a reinvestment rate for the entire industry group. I'm taking the product of those two and giving you a sustainable growth rate, but be careful about using that number because remember that number assumes that our, the return on investment capital and margins are not changing over time. So the sustainable growth equation is, a, is, is an effective one to think about what it is that drives growth for the long term, but it can deviate significantly from what you expect growth to be in the near term if margins are changing and accounting returns are changing. I hope you found this session useful and thank you very much for listening.